we keep coming back to the same place, the breath coming in, the breath going out, how you feel the breath energy in the body. Because we want to get familiar with this territory. We want to know it all the way in, all the way out, and to see the different things the breath can do until we get used to what its potentials are and used to how you can use it in different situations. Because even though this is the same place, the state of the body is going to change, the state of your mind is going to change. There are days when it's easy to settle in with a breath. It seems the most natural thing to do. Other days when it's hard to find one comfortable breath anywhere in the body at all. And part of the skill we're trying to develop is learning how to deal with whatever situation comes up. It's like an athlete trying to figure out all the different ways that the opposing team can come at him and have a move ready for whatever the opposition has to offer. The other reason we come back here, though, is that in a John Cha's image, we lost something. We lost it right here. And so wherever you lost it, you have to look right there. You probably know the old joke about the man who dropped something off the side of a ship. And so he waited until he got into port because the light was better to look off the side of the ship. Of course, that wasn't where he dropped it. He dropped it in the middle of the, middle of the ocean. What you've lost here is the ability to observe your mind in the present moment and see what it's doing. And so you've got to keep coming back to the present. Now, the frustrating thing is there are many layers going on here in the present. You may be able to solve one problem, and you come back, well, it seems to have come back from a different angle, which means is you haven't solved it from all the different angles. So one of the skills of the meditation is learning how to keep coming back to the same place and yet bring new eyes each time you come back, so you can see things from a slightly different angle. This is why there is no one meditation technique that's going to do the work for you. This is a common misunderstanding. That all you have to do is do as you're told, and the meditation will do the work. And all you have to do is put in the effort. But discernment doesn't rise that way. Discernment comes from being ingenious, from learning how to phrase new questions. You see this in the Buddha. You see this in the teachings of all the great masters. The Buddha came to his meditation with a question that was different from other people's questions. Other people were asking, where is my true self? And they came up with all kinds of answers. But the Buddha didn't ask that question. The question is, where is the suffering? What's causing it? What can I do to put an end to it? This is why he was so particular about the questions he would advise you to ask. And you start with his questions, but you find that you have to figure out your own questions. Because even though there are certain patterns that everyone has in common in terms of their greed, aversion, delusion, there are other aspects that are not quite the same, and you have to figure out what is your problem and come up with questions that are just right for you. We know the teachings of Dogen, the Zen master. So much is said about just sitting, just sitting, and it sounds like he's telling you just to sit and things are going to settle down on their own, but that's not what he was saying. He would bring a lot of different questions to the simple act of sitting. Is the mind sitting in the body? Is the body sitting in the mind? These are some of the questions he would bring. The purpose was to dig up a lot of unspoken assumptions. They see how they were skewing his perception of things. And those were just a few example questions that he would offer.
and encourage people to ask questions about this simple act of sitting, or the simple act of being with the breath, the simple act of focusing on the breath and the body. What's going on? We know the stories of Ajahn Mahabha's battle with pain. And it's very impressive the amount of pain that he was able to sit through. But the really important part of the teaching was not so much the, the endurance, but the questions he would ask. And as he said, he'd come to an understanding of pain one night and then realize that the questions he asked the night before, the next time he sat, weren't working. So he'd have to come up with new questions. So it's the ingenuity of your discernment that's going to make all the difference. There's some basic outlines. But within those outlines, you've got to figure out your own questions. It was the questions that John Mahabu asked that got a lot of other Ajahns thinking. I know quite a few Ajahns who found that reading Ajahn Mahabu was a spark their own insights. And again, it was not so much agreeing with his solutions, but it was agreeing with his technique of coming up with new questions, trying to figure out how do you relate to the pain, how do you relate to your desires. And you have to ask unusual questions, unexpected questions. That's how you learn. That's how your discernment develops. If you find that attachment to food is a problem, well, maybe part of the, the problem is your attachment to aversion. So look at your relationship to aversion. If you find that sitting long periods of t is a problem, ask yourself, okay, what is it in you that doesn't want to sit long periods of time? And there'll be a part of the mind that says, well, of course I don't like it because X, X, X. And you say, well, why? Pursue the issue a little bit further. And you begin to see there are certain mental moments that arise until you can't stand it. Well, the, the mental moment that arises was going to pass away. When you find you're back where you were before, it was okay. So you have to watch out for these things. Learn how to question your assumptions. And we keep coming back to the breath because it gives us a good grounding point. So we can compare tonight's issues with last night's issues. and see if there are slight differences. So the meditation requires patience, your ability to sit with things. So you can get really, really, really familiar with this territory. And at the same time, learning how to bring new eyes, learning how to ask new questions, questions that may seem off the wall. But you don't know until you try them to see how they're, they're going to work, because there are many layers of delusion in the mind. And John Lee talks of five layers of aggregates, layers of subtlety. Sometimes you deal with one layer and you think you've taken care of everything. Well, there's another layer and another layer. Kiyana Nayon talks of many layers of film in the mind. And each layer of film is going to require a different question to get past it. This is why the Buddha mentioned that one of his skills as a teacher was skill in questions. Knowing how to deal with different questions, knowing which, which questions are not worth asking, which ones are. And it's important that we bring that to the practice as well. If you expect that a particular technique is going to do the work for you, the defilements are going to eat you up, because they can see you coming from a mile away. You have to be quick on your feet, able to turn, turn the tables on them, turn the tables on your assumptions. When you get them off balance, then you can knock them out. But that's only if you learn how to be nimble with your questions. <laughs>